So I'm planning to add a second podcast episode every so often uh, to focus on some of the stories that I can't find authors or experts for, yet are still really fascinating and need to be told, and I've got a long list of them. As part of the new series, I'm looking for help uh, from a homicide detective, someone comfortable around cold cases. If you know anyone like this with some free time to spare that would be willing to review some really old murders and offer a modern law enforcement perspective, please message me on the Most Notorious Facebook page or email me at erivenous at yahoo.com. And oh yeah, this episode, while we're at it, contains adult themes and listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Most Notorious. I'm your host, Eric Rivenis. Today I'm joined by Arnie Bernstein. Back in January, we talked about his book, Swastika Nation. And today, just in time for the May 18th anniversary, we're going to discuss another of his books, this one called The Bath Massacre, a tragic, gut-twisting story of mass murder at a school in rural 1927 Michigan. Thanks so much for joining me again. Well, thanks for having me. It seems like in the last 15 years or so, we've seen a slew of school massacres. Many people don't realize, though, that there are historical precedents for this. Your book is about one of them. Yes. I didn't know it existed uh, until I discovered the story on the Internet myself. And once I looked at it, I it, it was just compelling. On May 18th of 1927, a school in Bath, Michigan, which is a small farming town about 12, 15 miles outside of Lansing, Michigan, exploded. And 38 children and six adults ultimately uh, died as a result. Can you talk a, a little bit about the community at Bath, Michigan in 1927? And would you mind describing it? Sure. I, I like to say that Bath, was and still is when you think of a, a small midwestern town it's it's the quintessential small midwestern town even today they don't have a stoplight downtown it's a four-way stop it didn't have electricity in 1927 I, I like to say that the roaring 20s roared right past bath they uh weren't isolated but there was no interstate at the time so lansing was it was a uh, hour or so drive from there today's about maybe 15 20 minutes but mostly, mostly farmers, you know, a few local businesses, the barbershop, the pharmacy, things like that, and a close-knit community. So let's talk about Andrew Kehoe. Who, who was he? Andrew Kehoe is such an enigma. He was born in the 1800s, late 1800s. I think he's from Holt, Michigan, or somewhere in that range. As a child, he was fascinated with creating little toys and little gadgets, things like that. And he's got to be older. He channeled that into the newfound magic of electricity. And he studied to become an electrician. He studied at Michigan State College, which is now uh, Michigan State University in Lansing. Uh, eventually went to St. Louis to study electricity as well. While he was there, he somehow was zapped and was in a coma for about two weeks. Came out of that and appeared fine. And then uh, from there, when basically working around the Midwest, worked in Iowa for a while uh, as a power linesman doing, you know, all kinds of electrical work and eventually worked his way back to his home in Michigan. And this accident that he suffered from, I know that there isn't concrete proof, but there is conjecture that his personality might have changed afterwards. Yeah, and there's really no way to know. I mean, it, it, it's it's easy to Monday morning quarterback these things, you know, you know, 100 years later. It's conceivable that it messed up his mind. It's conceivable that nothing happened as well. There's so many unknowns to Andrew Kehoe. He is a labyrinthine and an enigmatic figure, and there's so many mysteries to the man. 
Kehoe, at age 40, was living with his father and his father's new wife. But by all accounts, Kehoe was not friendly with her. Correct. Now, his father had remarried um, after Kehoe's mother had died. Uh, his new uh, wife, Frances, she and Kehoe were separated about, about three years. Conceivably, they could have been brother and sister. They did not get along at all. And, you know, there's some thoughts in inheritance, things like that. Uh, there was a new sibling, or half-sibling anyway. The, uh, Francis had a daughter with Keo's father, a child named Irene. And they just did not get along. It was constant bickering between the two and a total personality clash. And some resentment by Keho. Oh, definitely. Oh, th- that was there. That was definitely an element there. And the resentment by Keho eventually reaches a climax. Can you explain the, the circumstances that surround the death of Keho's father's wife? Yeah. Now, Francis had a, uh, a stove. It was petroleum-based. One account says it was oil. Another account says it was gasoline. Either way, it was some kind of petroleum-based gas stove. And it, it had a little tick to it that you always had to light the pilot light. It never stayed on. One day, she lights the pilot light. And... Through some terrible accident, it just, it just explodes on her. A whirlwind of flame engulfs her. She's screaming. She's you know, on fire. Kiho rushes in. He sees her on fire, takes a pitcher of water, and throws it on her. Now, we all know kitchen fires, what do you do? You throw baking powder or flour or something like that because water spreads oil. They don't mix, obviously. The worst thing he could have done was throw water on her. And this caused the burns to spread on her. Uh, the child ran in, Irene. The father at this point is quite an ill elderly man, and he's trying to get through the house on a couple of canes, hearing his wife scream. At this point, Fran is just a wreck. She's horribly burned. They get her into bed, and the stench in the house is terrible. And Kehoe and Irene go to the neighbor next door. The neighbor next door has a phone. Uh, the Kehoe's had no phone at the time. And Keo very nonchalantly says, could we borrow your phone? And he said, Franny's been burned. You know, like she had dropped a pot of hot water or something on her foot. <laughs> and uh, he says, oh, by the way, could you call a priest? And <laughs> yeah, it, it, it completely inappropriate to say the least. Now, after the uh, bath school bombing, people, you know, and this story came to light. People thought, did Keho kill her? Did Keho rig the stove? He had the knowledge, certainly. He had the mechanical knowledge to do this. He certainly had the motivation to do it. Did he do it? There's no way to know. But his, his behavior certainly was odd, to, to say the least. Odd is a very mild word here. But his, his behavior certainly, when he saw her, you know, ablaze, throwing water on her, going next door very nonchalantly saying, you know, hey, she's burned. Can you call a priest, by the way? It, it, it doesn't make sense in a rational mind. Right, exactly. So, Andrew Kehoe continues on. Eventually, he marries a woman named Nellie, and they move to Bath. Can you talk about how the couple fit in? How were they perceived by the community? Sure. Now, he and Nellie had met a few years earlier when he was studying at Michigan State. And then, of course, he went to St. Louis and all that. He came back, and um, eventually they reconnected, and they married now, her uncle was a very well-known man in the area, had run for Senate, um, did not win, but was still, you know, very well-known, very powerful man in the area. He had a house in Bath, which he sold to Nellie and Kehoe. It was a farmhouse with uh, about 80 acres, a very nice, elegant house. They moved in and were alternately nice neighbors and also very curious neighbors. Kehoe became involved in local politics. It, it wasn't perfectly normal. If he, he was going to live there, why not be involved? He played cards at the local clubhouse. They had like a, a it wasn't really a clubhouse, but it was like a, a community house where people would play cards, where they would have dances, things like that. Uh, he was constantly getting into fights over the card games, over people sticking to the rules exactly. And he was a bit cantankerous, as it were, a little bit odd at times. Other times, perfectly normal and nothing odd about him at all. He was just, you know, there was just sort of the odd neighbors. He ran for the school board, even though they had no children. He felt that if his taxes were going to go to the school, then he should have a say on it, which made sense. 
Now, the Bath School is called the Bath Consolidated School. Formerly, and this is standard for rural communities of the of the time, we're talking the early 1920s, they were all one-room schoolhouses. And the one-room schoolhouse was, you know, slowly but surely fading out. And so what they did was consolidate all the schools in the area, all the one-room schoolhouses, into one large school, you know, hence the Bath Consolidated School. And he served as treasurer of the school board. He would constantly get into fights with other board members, as well as the superintendent of the schools, a man named Emery Hike. I, I've, I've worked in education for many years and attended school board meetings. And it's not strange, it's not unusual to have somebody like that on a board who's constantly fighting with, you know, the, the superintendent or a president or what have you. Uh, in fact, after the book came out, some friends of mine said to me, you based those those arguments between Kehoe and Hike on, on those two people, didn't you? I said, no, but it sure was a good model. Hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's standard stuff. You know, it's if anybody's ever been to a school board meeting knows exactly what I'm talking about. So he was constantly wanting to make sure every penny was spent properly. And I mean every penny. He was meticulous about the books. As I say, he was a tre- he was the treasurer. And if things didn't go his way in a school board meeting, he would motion to dismiss. And in looking over the old school board records, which I actually got to see, there were constant dismiss. We must dismiss. We must dismiss because he wasn't getting his way. He also was rather strange in his farming habits. He would farm in a suit and tie, which, you know, I, I kind of picture, you know, if you remember the old TV show Green Acres and you saw Mr. Douglas, you know, on his tractor in his suit and tie, I kind of picture him that way. It was a really kind of strange way to farm, but he, he, they said he always had a crisp white shirt on. And if he's got a little bit of dirt on his shirt, he would go in, he would change and put a new one on. And he owned the, the latest in farming technology. Yeah, he had a he had a tractor, he had a gasoline tractor, which not a lot of people had. He didn't have a car at the time. He didn't get a car into actually a truck until later. But yeah, he had a tractor. People came to look at it. It was said that his tool shed was cleaner than some people's homes. It was so, everything was just immaculate in, in its cleanliness and the way things were laid out and carefully placed. So he was an interesting kind of character. He was also the go-to guy for dynamite in the area. Now, this is not unusual because he w- he was great for stump blasting. If, for people who don't know, stump blasting is if you're a farmer, you got a, uh, a an old tree stump or an old boulder in your field. You can't drag it out with a horse; it'll kill the horse. It'll if you try to drag it out with your car, it'll wreck your car. So what would they do? They'd blow it up. And he was the expert in blowing up tree stumps and boulders. Today they use giant grinders to get them up, but back then it was explosives. So it was not unusual. To go to Kehoe's and get, you know, explosives and have him do this for people. He, so he had lots and lots of dynamite as well as something called pyrotol, which was a World War I uh, surplus explosive that was used on the battlefields. He isn't very good at social interaction. He's compulsive, intense. His mind gets preoccupied with specific things, especially things that aggravate him. And he can't refocus on anything else. And I certainly won't suggest a diagnosis, but I'm sure modern day doctors certainly could. He is very obsessive and obsessive and compulsive. I don't know. It's just, you know, I tried writing some stuff from his point of view just so I could get inside his head. And it was impossible. I ended up throwing it all out. You know, it was just as an exercise. It wasn't to go in the book in the first place. It was just an exercise to try to get inside his head. I found it impossible to penetrate. He's so enigmatic and so focused in his own strange way. What what he was was the classic psychopath. Now we know, you know, psychopath from the movies, you know, with, with you know the guy running around with a, with a chainsaw or whatever. But there there is a doctor's name is David Hare, and he has studied psychopathy and came up with something called the uh, gold standard, the Hare checklist, which is you know kind of a gold standard for psychopathic behaviors. And Kehoe marked very high on all these, uh, you know, after the fact, you know, this thing came out in the, the 1970s. But when I was going through it, Kehoe was just one right after the other was clocking in on the psychopathic checklist. Among other things, they're able to live dual lives, which Kehoe, as we will see, did. They have no remorse, um, unable to connect with reality in a certain way. 
no consciousness whatsoever. And this can apply from anything from Andrew Kehoe to your office bully who just gets a kick out of hurting other people at work and getting away with it. So I mean, psychopathy is a pretty broad spectrum of a mental disorder that, unfortunately, because of the movies, we think of as a, a Julie Madman. So the central character conflict in the story, uh, to go back to it, is between Kehoe and Superintendent Hike. Hike is always looking out for the best interests of, of his students. That's his perspective. And Kehoe is motivated by the financial bottom line. Is this the origin of their conflict? Yes, it's that simple. And that's part of just the horror of this whole thing. It was that simple, that Kehoe and Hike were constantly fighting over money. And Kehoe was also, when it came to his own finances, was rather unusual. He, as I say, was a farmer, but he started letting his crops rot. He felt that if the farmer controlled the crops, then he could control the prices. And if he could control the prices, he could control his own destiny. Therefore, he started letting his, his crops go to seed and just letting the, fee, the fields rot and figuring he could drive up the prices or drive down the prices and control his own destiny. He also stopped paying the mortgage on his house. Now, again, the house had been sold to him by Nellie's uncle, and there was no way they were going to foreclose on it. But it was a concern that, you know, years went by and he simply refused to pay the mortgage on it. He often said the taxes on the school were ruining him. And someone once came with a foreclosure notice. And Nellie was constantly sick. She had some sort of lung disease, may have been tuberculosis, may have been something else. But she was constantly sick and they were supposed to be served with a foreclosure notice. Nobody was going to foreclose on them. It was owned, as I say, by Nellie's uncle, and nobody was going to foreclose on them. But word was sent to the uh, foreclosure people, please don't send it out. Nellie is very sick. They didn't get it, the word fast enough. And when the guy came to serve the foreclosure notice, Keo looked at it and said, well, these taxes are going to be the end of me. This, if it wasn't for that school, I could have made this mortgage. His mismanagement of their farm causes their financial difficulty, but he's bound to determine to, to blame the school for his own poor performance. Exactly. Exactly. And again, that's part of the, the psychopathy checklist is blaming others, not taking responsibility for your own actions. And, you know, with a vengeance, as we will see. And that's, that's exactly how Kehoe was. In the weeks and months leading up to the bombing, Kehoe is involved in some other questionable behavior, including the death of two animals. Yeah, well, he killed the neighbor's dog. Now, there's some, there's different versions of how he killed the dog. Uh, one is he poisoned it, one is he shot it. But the bottom line is, yeah, he admitted to the neighbor across the street that he had indeed killed their dog because the thing was constantly running around on his property, and he was very upset about that. Another incident was he had a horse, and he pretty much worked the poor animal to death. He was furious with it and just worked it. It, it was an old nag. He just worked it to death, literally. And the rendering plant, plant came to pick the thing up. He was just, he, he was cruel to the animal. There's so much about Keo. It's, it's straightforward and simple, but, you know, obviously there's some pretty terrible things beneath this straightforward and simple. It's all of these little things adding up, one after another. In hindsight, you know, we understand. I mean, there's always going to be an idiot neighbor who's, who does some pretty awful things. So when I talk to some of the survivors of this thing, who were children when it happened, to a person, they all say, he was so nice to us kids. He was always nice to us, you know, tipping his hat and asking how we were and all these things. And nice man to the kids. And yet, those were his victims. And Kehoe continues to do strange things. He starts selling a lot of his belongings out of the blue. Yeah, he gave a horse to one of his neighbors. It was an old horse of his. It had one eye in it. And he made it sound like he was giving it away as a gift. And when he, the man came over to the house to collect the horse, Keo presented him with a bill of sale. And the man thought, wait a minute, I'm not buying this horse. I thought you were giving it to me. And eventually he returned the horse. He said, you know, I, I can't really afford to buy this horse. And Keo said, oh, you're crazy. He also had a gun and his neighbor across the street, he challenged the, one, the man who, in fact, whose dog he had killed. Um, somehow they made amends. They had a shooting contest 
And the man was uh, interested in buying Keo's gun, but Keo said, no, no, I just bought this gun. I don't want to sell it. And this was maybe four or five days before the bombing. And one of the things he's doing with the money is buying dynamite. Yes, lots and lots of dynamite. And again, he was the go-to guy for dynamite. He was going into Lansing and bringing back dynamite and pretty much stockpiling it. But it didn't seem unusual. It didn't seem unusual at all. Farmers had it, and he was the town stump blaster. There there was nothing on the surface seemed odd about this at all. So we've talked a lot about the bad guy so far, but the heart and soul of your book lies in the stories of the children. The stories are just heart-wrenching. This is such a tragic, tragic, unbelievably horrific event, made so much worse because the victims are just kids. Let's go to the morning of May 18th, 1927. Can you talk about what the morning was like? Sure. It it had rained the night before, so it was one of those fresh spring mornings in Bath. People later remember that the smell of lilacs was in the air. They, They were having a problem at the school. The town did not have electricity, as I said before. Literally that day, Consumer Power Men, which was the electric company, was stringing wires to go into Bath. They gave Kehoe a call and said, we need some help. The generator at the school wasn't working. And that's how they had electricity at the school was through a generator. A few people in town, including Kehoe and other businesses, had generators for electricity. Now, again, Kehoe was a master electrician. He was on the school board. So he was trusted to do a lot of the work at the school as well. And he volunteered to do it for free. In retrospect, people realize this is probably how he was able to pull off what he did. He went to the school, met with a couple other guys, the janitor and another member of the school board. It was about 8.15 or so, and he was very acting very nervous and very odd. And, you know, they were looking at the generator, and he said, I've, I've got to go. I, I can't wait. And he took off. They thought it was a little strange, but, you know, okay, whatever. At 8.45, there's a massive explosion. It was two-story school. It raises about four or six feet in the air. There's no fire, but it's it's an explosion. And then it collapses on itself. Now, only the north wing of the school went up. The majority of the school was intact, but it was the north wing of the school that collapsed downward on itself. The second floor sort of pancaked down under the first floor. Nobody knew what had happened. They thought perhaps the boiler had exploded or something like that. At the same time, a fire breaks out at Kehoe's, at Kehoe's house, and it spreads rapidly through the house, into his chicken coops. He had no chickens, by the way, but into the chicken coops, into his barn, and it's really quickly an inferno, and something really serious is going on in Bath. Now, the explosion itself was heard well into Lansing, um, and people felt it. It was almost like an earthquake kind of feeling. Everybody in town had a kid in the school. Some, of course, had more than one. People rushed into town. They couldn't believe what was happening. They were screams, cries, people clawing through the debris trying to get their kids out. They didn't have heavy equipment. They were literally pulling debris with their hands to get at the children that were inside the school. Glass was shattered for miles around. Uh, Farmers were coming in. People from Main Street were coming in to, you know, out of the businesses. Desperate. Meanwhile, Kehoe's farm is ablaze, and people near the farmhouse are looking and seeing what this is and seeing what's happening to our friend Andrew Kehoe. His house is on fire. It's a very odd combination that happened almost simultaneously. The, the whole thing is incredibly surreal. Screams, as you mentioned, chaos, people running around, dust floating in the air from the rubble. And and bystanders almost immediately notice a group of older students standing on part of the roof that is still intact. Yeah, they were able to escape and jump out of part of the building onto a roof. And from there they would jump. It was it was sort of like a a side roof. And from there they would jump to the ground. A couple of kids, you know, broke bones, things like that, jumping. But actually, a lot of the high school kids were out that day because they didn't have to take their exams if they had done well throughout the year. And so they were involved in this immediate rescue, which had to start. Nobody had time to think. You just had to start the rescue. Something horrible had happened. And as I say, they thought the boiler had exploded. Now, there was only one 
phone line going in and out of bath at the time. They, you know, he was the old fashioned phone with the, you know, with one operator. They had like a phone exchange building in town. It was like a little cottage. And the woman was desperately plugging in, you know, the phone lines, calling into Lansing, help, help, you know, send us ambulances, send us trucks. We need help here. There's been a disaster. And again, nobody knows at this point what had happened. They thought, as I say, the boiler had exploded. They're pulling children out. They started triage in front of the school. Um, women are making bandages out of, out of bed sheets, things like that. Also forming in front of the school is a temporary morgue. They're just lining up the bodies and putting blankets over them. And the, the shoes are sticking out. And some people were able to identify their children simply by looking at the shoes. There's a photograph in the book of this uh, temporary morgue. It's, it's harrowing to see. The school, as you said, is two stories high. So there are layers upon layers of, of rubble after the collapse. Some children are pulled out immediately, both dead and alive. Others are buried far beneath, and, and their voices can be heard screaming and crying from below. And they end up pulling out children all day long. Right. And it's, it took, I mean, it took all day. And of course, some events happened, you know, later that morning that, that radically changed everything. But, you know, some children were able to pull themselves out. As I say in the book, they look like dust covered moles of sorts. One boy, he's a kindergartner, he grabbed his chair and he ran home with it. And years later, and I'm talking decades later, there's now at the, the, the old school building is long torn down, but at the, the elementary school in town now, there's like a museum devoted to, it's called the Bath School Museum, that's devoted to that day. And the family years later returned the chair that this kid, you know, ran off with and more or less sat in the family attic. Um, that's one of the few, you know, funny stories out of this. I, it was just heartbreak upon heartbreak. There's, you know, parents are holding their children. The one woman I, I, is holding two of her children in her arms. They're both dying in her arms. Another man is, his son is in front of him and he's just smashing his hands into the ground, screaming prayers while the, the, the poor child lays dead in front of him. One boy is found and, uh, Hike carries him across the rubble and lays him on the a couch that's in front of the telephone exchange office. This boy is unconscious, but he's the first alive victim that's pulled from the rubble. People are trapped. There's a, a teacher who was trapped inside. She couldn't move. She was, you know, trapped within the debris. Her head was wedged between a couple of boards. And there was, she realized there was a boy just above her. His face was literally just above hers. And she realized that he was dead. His eyes were open and staring wide open at hers. And she couldn't move. And she started screaming. There's nothing she could do. They found another teacher, a woman named Hazel Weatherby. She was 21 years old. She was the second grade teacher. When they found her in the rubble, she was barely alive. She had a child in each arm. Both children were dead. And what I think happened is when the, the school started collapsing, her teacher instincts just kind of kicked in and she pulled the children into her arms. When the rescuers came and found her, she was half buried in the rubble. She handed over the children and then she gave into death herself. She was a teacher to the end, you know, looking out for her children, looking out for her students. Another story that is stuck in my memory. There was a girl buried in the debris who was alive, but felt someone below her who she couldn't see kicking at her. And eventually the kicking just stops. And she'd later find out that the boy beneath her didn't make it. Yeah. You know, these kids didn't know what was going on. You know, one one boy saw a beam about the size of a dime of light, you know, just shining through. And, you know, how, how did I get here? He had no clue. And he heard another boy yelling within there. And gradually, slowly but surely, they started pulling these kids out. Now, they started thinking maybe we need to get the roof off because, as I say, the roof had collapsed. And there's a photograph in the book you can see of the building that sheared off down the side. And you can see the coat closet on the building that remains. And the coats are still, you know, hung up meticulously on the hooks. It's it's a remarkable photograph. But they thought, we've got to get this roof off so we can get to more kids. So they were going to get a telephone pole and use it as a, you know, for, they were putting in the power line. So they were going to get one of those poles and use it sort of as a lever to see if they could use it to get the roof off and get to more kids. Meanwhile, back at Kehoe, the house is ablaze. And some of his neighbors are standing outside wondering what's going on. They see him pulling his truck out, and he looks at them, and he says, boys, you're my friends. You better get out of here. You better go down to the school. They look at each other. What is he talking about? 
and then Kehoe heads off towards the school. Now, some men from the consumer's power company, they rushed into the burning house trying to see if anyone else was in there. You know, they're calling out, they're calling out. And then, they, they, you know, they see drawers, they, they, you know, they start moving out couches, things like that. They, they open up the drawer and there's dynamite inside of it. And they realize something really horrible is going out. And they run out of there just before the dynamite goes off. And it's later discovered that Kehoe had wired the entire house, that he had cut the trees on his property. So they looked like they were still, it's called girding, girding the trees. And he cut them so they looked like they were still alive, but they weren't. He replaced the branches. His horses were hobbled inside the barn. They, their legs were tied together and they were roasted alive. It's a horrible thing. So Keo drives down from his burning farm, pulls up in front of the school. And on the way to the school, a little girl was running across the street. He tipped his hat to her and then continued driving to the school. Ugh. I know. It, it's incredible. You got to wonder what's going on in today's man's head. He pulls up in front of the school. He and Hike, as much as they hate each other, Hike runs over to him. He says, we need your truck. We've got to get ropes. We've got to get ladders. We've got to help these kids. Kia looks directly at Hike. He says, okay, I'll take you with me. And Hike gets this look of horror on his face. And he says, you know something about this, don't you? By one account, there's a struggle. Um, another account, Kio doesn't have a problem. Either way, he has a gun. He fires it into the cab of his truck, hits a cache of dynamite that blows up the truck, blows himself up, takes Hike with him, as he said, and Kio had packed the truck cab with old farm implements, nails, screws, things like that. And it works like shrapnel and it fires out and hits people, kills a couple of the rescuers, kills a boy who had escaped earlier from the initial bombing and he's killed. And uh, there was a woman who was holding a baby at the edge, at the perimeter of all this. She gets hit in the eye, but she has the wherewithal. She still holds on to the baby. And the baby is unharmed, but she, she, she ends up losing an eye over this thing. But at that moment, people realized this was no random boiler explosion, but that Kehoe had done this. And suddenly it changed from, a, from some sort of catastrophe to a crime. And he comes back to the scene of the crime, completely calm and unmoved by the horrible death that he's caused. And he doesn't care because his sole purpose is to take his arch enemy out with him. Exactly. They found later, too. Now, they found later that morning, as I say, the main part of the school remained, but they discovered that somehow or other he had wired the school with 600 pounds of explosives. As I say, about a, they think about 100 went off. And for some reason or other, maybe the timer didn't work, maybe there was a, a surge of electricity or something, uh, wires ripped during the initial explosion, who knows? But only 100 pounds went off. If all 600 pounds had gone off, Bath would have been just leveled. The town would have been leveled. But, you know, for some reason or other, it didn't. And Nellie is missing. That's the other thing. Nellie Kehoe is missing. No one knows where she is. And her sisters, when they get the news, they want to know, where's Nellie? Hike, as you write in your book, was quite a hero between the time the explosion took place and when he was killed by Andrew Kehoe. Yeah, he... He had to marshal everything. He was, you know, as I say, nobody knew what was going on. And he had to marshal everything. Uh, he was running back and forth from the site of the explosion to places that were turning into triage, to the place that was turning into the morgue, to the high school boys and helping them get started, you know, with ladders and things like that, um, pulling kids out himself. He was he really was was the hero of the day um, and ultimately one of the martyrs of the day as well uh, when he was murdered by Kehoe. So the loss of life and the suffering is overwhelming for the community, but the Hart family gets it the worst. Can, can you talk about their loss? They lost three children. They were the ones who lost the most most children out of the entire, you know, I mean, like I say, most people had, you know, at least one, if not more children in the school. It was later estimated about 275 kids were in the school at the time. Some were out, as I say, because of the exams and things like that. Yeah, but the Hart family lost three of their children. Just terrible, terrible situation. And as I said before, one woman was cradling two children in her arms. That was um, that was Mrs. Hart. I, I can't even imagine what that poor woman went through. Um, and another child of theirs was injured as well and had 
severe damage in his foot when shrapnel went into his foot. You were able to interview some of the survivors of the explosion firsthand, weren't you? Yes, I talked to four survivors, which was quite an experience, as you can imagine. At this point, they were all elderly um, in their 80s, their 90s, but it was as though it had happened yesterday, as you can imagine. Now, one of, one of the survivors, she and I actually got to be very close, uh, Josephine cushman Vale, and uh, her brother Ralph Cushman was killed in the explosion. She was about 14. He was seven. And she she and I got to be, as I say, we got to be pretty close um, as a result of this book. She died actually about four or five years ago. She lived to 100. And when I was interviewing her, she told me some of the some of the most harrowing stuff in the book. I mean, it, it, I, as she was telling me all this, I thought, I don't want to upset this poor woman. She was 94 at the time. And, you know, you want your book to be the best it can be, but on the other hand, you don't want to upset someone, you know, that elderly. And I said, Josephine, you don't have to tell me this stuff. And she said, no, I want people to know. She said, I'm not going to be here forever. I want people to know what happened that day. And I'm glad she did. She was forthright and very matter of fact about some of the most horrible things that uh, another person could possibly see. I can't even imagine. I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, to the woman who was holding the baby. You have a personal connection to that story. After the book came out, I was at a book festival in Grand Rapids, and an elderly woman came up to me, and she and her son came up to me and introduced themselves. I said, hello. It turned out she was the baby who had been held. The story of the woman who was holding the baby on the edge when the eye... She was hit in the eye with a, a bolt or something, lost her eye, and didn't drop her baby. This woman was the baby. I almost passed out. I couldn't believe it. She hey. showed me a picture of her mother, and the mother was like holding her head to the side because she said that her mother never wanted her picture taken directly on because she had lost her eye. Incredible. So let's go back for a moment to the Kehoe farm. Nellie, who has been missing, finally turns up. They let Kehoe's farm just burn. There's no point in putting out the fire there. They... They had to concentrate the rescue on the school. The next day, they, you know, there's police cordon around the place. And where's Nellie? Where's Nellie? Everybody's been looking. Nobody knows. A couple of uh, National Guardsmen who are watching the place, and actually they're Michigan State Police, excuse me, were, you know, watching the place. They decide to go out back, take a smoke break, and they see a cart. And the cart, they realize, has a skeleton on it that's burned beyond recognition. And they found Nellie you know, more or less hiding in plain sight there. It was a real macabre scene. There was a, a strong box next to her that had some like the family silverware, things like that with, you know, with a K crest on it. There was the, there were like war bonds and, and rolls of money within this strong box as well. And who knows if that money would have been able to pay off the mortgage or why that was even there. Or it did Kehoe even know this was in the box. Nellie's skull was cracked now, was it because he bludgeoned her or because, you know, without getting too disgusting here, the brain, when it's under intense heat like that, would expand and would conceivably crack the skull in trying to get out uh, because it's turning into gas. So th theoretically, the skull could have cracked that way. Nobody knows how Nellie died. Did she die even before all this happened? Who knows? It's just one of those great unknowns. But on the edge of the farm, is a, they find a, st a stenciled sign. It says, criminals are made, not born. In other words, you made me do this. So even at the end, he's, he's putting the blame on anyone but himself. Exactly. An interesting part of the story, which reveals, I think, a lot about Kehoe's mindset. Sometime prior to the bombing, Kehoe mails a package. Could you talk about how this package was discovered and what was inside? Right. And... He had packed it in an old dynamite crate, too. You know, he certainly had them, you know, around. So he was sending it off to uh, an accountant for the school who was, you know, handling, you know, the school accounts. And they were frantically searching for this box. They finally found it. They brought it to the police headquarters. They put it in an isolated area. They gingerly opened it up, fearing that he had conceivably rigged it with more explosives, which was, at that point, it was certainly within the realm of possibility. And instead, they found a note. I'm resigning from the school board. Here are the most recent books. I made a mistake in the last book. I was uh, off by two cents. 
then he would say, I'm resigning, I'm leaving the school board, you know, in this note. It was just a final twist of, you know, the, the psychological knife, I guess, to the town of Bath, you know, in, in doing this. In the midst of all this devastation, it's really inspiring how not only the town of Bath, but the entire state of Michigan came together over this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's another one of those, those wonderful, I mean, after 9-11, you know, as horrifying as it was, everybody came together to help out. You know, after, you know, the, another major explosion in Oklahoma City, people came together, and that's what happened. Contributions came from around the world. Uh, the people were raising money. There were, you know, prisoners at, at a prison in Michigan raised money. There was a, a fight promoter in Detroit gave, you know, all the money from a, from the night's fight to, you know, help it. Children from around the world raise money. They got a letter from Italy saying, here's, here's money that we raised. We are, you know, we're second graders. We, you know, we understand what happened. We feel terrible. Um, and it, so it was a real great community coming together to help each other out. On the other hand, there was a real terrible aspect of a community coming together. And that was people wanted to see the sites. And as I said before, Bath is at that time, it was an isolated town, and it still is a, a lot of it looks like it looked in 1927. As I say, there's no stoplights in town. There's just a four-way stop sign. But people wanted to see everything. They estimated that weekend that some 50,000 people tried to come into Bath to see the sites, to see the, the exploded school, to see Kehoe's farm. And it got to be so insane with the amount of people coming in. Now, I've been in Bath many times, and if there's 10 cars on Main Street, that's a traffic jam. Imagine 50,000 cars. People couldn't get around to go to the funerals because there were so many cars of people trying to get into the town to see it. They couldn't hear these. They couldn't hear the funerals that were going on in the living rooms and the funeral parlors in town. It, it, it was just unconscionable that so many people would want to see this. It's I, I still have a hard time understanding that aspect of the story. They, and they finally had to send the uh, Michigan State Police telling people, get out, go away. It was Traffic was backed up for nine miles. They said, go away, you know, get out. We don't want you to come into town. And this is before the interstate came in, too, so people had to work hard to get there. Can you talk about the, the benefactor that suddenly appears ready to swoop in and save the day? whether for personal motive or hopefully something more noble than that. We're talking about James Cousins, Senator James Cousins. And he, I think he was sincere. He wasn't out for any, you know, grandiose, um, you know, self-serving means. But he had invested well in the automotive industry and was quite wealthy. You know, as they were raising money, he said, I'm going to rebuild the school. He donated enormous amounts of money. And unfortunately, this slowed down donations because people thought they had enough money now since Senator Cousins and Cousins had given so much money. But he gave money and eventually the school was rebuilt. Um, it was changed from Bath Consolidated School to the uh, James Cousins School uh, as a result. But it was on his part, it, was, it was, came from a really deep, sincere place to see that this town restarted, that life continued. Does that rebuilt school still stand today? No, it was torn down actually in the 1970s. And ironically, it was torn down right about the time of the uh, commemoration of the bombing on May 17th, on uh, May 18th, excuse me. It was quite controversial too when it was torn down. It, as you can imagine, it was, you know, it had such importance in the town, but the building had outlived its usefulness. And, you know, by the 1970s, the school originally built in the 1920s simply wasn't feasible anymore and there were all kinds of structural problems and things like that but it became a park and it's actually quite lovely it's it's the memorial park it's called the james cousins memorial park and the cupola that stood on the top of the school now stands in the center of the park in roughly the same area that it would have you know that it was standing in the school on that property and there's markers with the names of, you know, all the victims with, except, of course, uh, Kehoe and Nellie left off for obvious reasons. And there's bricks lining around the cupola with the name of each victim on it. It's, it's, it's really nice area. Uh, and as I say, there's a, there's a museum in the school across the street, the Bath School Museum. And in the park itself, you can see some posts that were probably the original um, posts you know, they're, they're in the ground, but you, they were some posts that were probably part of the original structure 
of the school. What's really powerful in town is if you drive a little bit further, there's the cemetery, Pleasant Hill Cemetery, where 17 of the children are buried, and as well as some of the uh, the rescuers who were killed that day. And it's it's really powerful to walk through that cemetery and see all these little graves, 1910 to 1927, you know, or 1912, 1927. They were mostly, you know, first and second graders who were killed. And it, it's quite something to see. In fact, when I first started doing the book, I thought, what a wonderful story this is. I can't wait to do this story. And it was well, the first time I came to Bath, I walked around, you know, I, I walked around the park, things like that. And then I walked into the cemetery and grave upon grave upon grave. And it stopped being a story that I was going to do a book about. And I realized I had a duty to these children to do this book and do it right and to tell their story and make sure I did it right and honor their memory. And I'd like to think I succeeded in doing that. I did my damnedest, certainly. You did. It is a really moving and emotional book. One of the happy moments you write about at the at the end of the book happens at the 50th anniversary of the massacre. A few of the surviving high school students were able to experience something that was Im- impossible for them in the aftermath of the explosion. Right. Obviously, the graduation was canceled in 1927, but 50 years later, in 1977, they gave them uh, diplomas and they had them walk across the stage and um, handed out their diplomas to them. It was it was quite a moving moment. And periodically through the years, uh, when they dedicated uh, a Michigan State marker, a historical marker was dedicated in town. There was a boulder that was put in the in the park with a plaque on it. And Hike's widow, who had since remarried, she was among the many people who was there that day to see this thing unveiled. Do you think the Bath Massacre is relevant to us today? You know, that's a question I get a lot. And it's, you know, it's a really hard one to answer. It's it, to me, it's it says that these things are nothing new. Unfortunately, we think it's a modern phenomenon, but it's not. And what got me most, I think, was when Sandy Hook happened. Well, first of all, the, the book itself, it opens with the shooting at uh, Virginia Tech, which was just maybe a month before the 80th commemoration of the school bombing. And. I opened it with that because there were a lot of similarities between the way the shooter there behaved and Kehoe as well. When he, for example, when the, the kid sent the tape to NBC, you know, screaming, you made me do this. This wasn't my, you know, wasn't my fault. It was like Kehoe sign saying the criminals are made, not born. You know, he killed someone first and then went and killed a lot of other people and then killed himself. I mean, so there was a lot of things that Cho did that sort of relate to Kehoe, but even more so with Sandy Hook. There were there were so many things that resonated with me on that day. I mean, the most important one, I think, is Vicky DeSoto, the teacher who stood in front of the killer and in front of her students. And she was killed. And I, I thought of Hazel Weatherby instantly when I heard about that, because there was Hazel Weatherby in the middle of this rubble. She clearly did exactly what Vicky DeSoto did. They, she protected her students as the rubble was falling down. It was one of those profound things that happened. As things turned out, I knew someone in Connecticut, a minister in Connecticut, who actually had helped me with my, my book, Swastika Nation, which we had talked about in the last time. And after Sandy Hook happened, I emailed her. I said, Shannon, what's going on there? Do you know what's going on? She said, yeah, I live four miles from there. I was in the firehouse when they told them that the kids weren't coming home. I said, oh, dear God. And I thought, and this is one of those things where, you know, as Einstein said, you know, God doesn't roll dice with the universe. And I think this is one of those moments I realized, you know, and I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. I certainly don't want to take any undue credit for this. But I realized I was sort of a fulcrum between these two horrible incidents. And realistically, both Sandy Hook and Bath are the two deadliest, you know, school killings in America. And. I called my friends in Bath. I said, look, you guys know better than anyone else what happened here. And they said they sent a letter to the people of Sandy Hook that was published in the local paper. And my friend wrote a letter back to the people of Bath. Now, every year they they have a like a luncheon that it's it's called the school reunion luncheon. They have uh, all the classes come and it's held at the, the, the school like every on the Saturday closest to the commemoration of the bombing. 
And I do like to say commemoration, not anniversary, because to me, anniversary denotes something happy, whereas commemoration, I think, has more of the somberness that something like this needs. But anyway, I was at this luncheon where they read these two letters. And as you can imagine, you know, there, there just wasn't a dry eye in the house. It was it was a profound, deep moment that I, I will never forget. You know, these two towns linked by the most horrific of inexplicable things that could possibly happen. Where can people buy your book or learn more about this? Uh, they can certainly go to my website, arniebernstein.com. It's available on Amazon. It's published by uh, University of Michigan Press. You can certainly go to uh, University of Michigan Press and buy it as well. And if people want to connect with me, there's also on Facebook, there is a page for the book, uh, the Bath Massacre page on Facebook, as well as my own Facebook page if people want to connect with me. And again, we've only scratched the surface today, and I highly recommend on this 89th commemoration of the massacre to pick up a copy and learn more. Thank you again for your time. Oh, thank, thanks for having me again. I'm, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I like what you're doing. I, I appreciate your kind words. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's it for this week's episode of Most Notorious, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis. If you have not done so yet, leave an iTunes rating or review for me. Pretty please. Thanks for listening, and have a safe tomorrow. This is Stacy on her motorcycle. What an incredible view! And this is Stacy off her motorcycle. Does this have sucralose in it? On her motorcycle. Oh, the wind in my hair! Off her motorcycle. Uh, it's pronounced etc., not etc. On. Woohoo! Yes! Off. No. You're better on your bike. And with basic policy starting at $75 a year, quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates annual premium for basic liability policy not available in all states.